Studies. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Esther Bianchi. Um, well, most of you, are, not all of you, are familiar with Esther. She was here presented for us two years ago when she was a visiting scholar, and she's once again a visiting scholar at the center this quarter and last quarter. Um, Esther is the Associate Professor of Chinese Religions and Philosophy, Society and Culture of China and Chinese Literature in the Department of Philosophy at the University of uh, Perugia. She's also uh, affiliated with two of the giants of research in um, France, in the CNRS and the EPHE, where she received her PhD in conjunction with uh, the University of Venice. She's written on, a, has a long CV, has written on a wide variety of topics, including uh, the great pilgrim Fasian, Everything from the, the Pilgrim Faxian up to a prominent contemporary uh, Chinese nun, uh, Longye. She's written on the recitation of the names of Manjushri, these kind of devotional practices, and she's uh, edited a large work on uh, Taoism, work mm -hmm. on Taoism as well. In recent years, she's worked on two major projects. One, uh, together with Daniela Campo, is a study of the Vinaya revival in 20th century uh, mainland China and in Taiwan. The other big project that she's worked on for some years and that she presented to us on last time was on the um, interest in Tibetan Buddhism in, among Han Chinese in China. And so she's building on that project into this next project, which is the uh, fascination in contemporary Chinese Buddhism with uh, Theravada Buddhism which, as I think she's going to show us today, has roots that go back into the early part of the 20th century. Um, so with that as background, please join me in welcoming Esther Bianchi. Thank you, John. Thank you. So uh, this study uh, is part of my research in progress on Chinese Buddhism and the Theravada model. Here. And, uh, which aims at investigating the role and the impact of a Theravada-inspired doctrines and particularly practices in the development of Chinese modern Buddhism throughout the entire 20th century. Uh, I wish to thank the Department of Religious Studies and the uh, Center for Buddhist Studies at Stanford University for inviting me as a visiting researcher for the spring semester 2019. Your fabulous libra libraries are provided with rich funds of Buddhist materials dating back to Republican China. In these months, I have consulted and collected a vast selection of articles and other documents, which have allowed me to make considerable improvement in my knowledge of the very origin of the phenomenon. As a matter of fact, the presence of Theravada-inspired forms of practice within Chinese Buddhism has become increasingly visible uh, nowadays, uh, and particularly in the last three decades. Particularly, this is true for the field of monastic discipline and for meditation. But I believe that the understanding, that understanding this presence necessitates inquiring into the very origins of the phenomenon, uh, and it is my starting assumption that the emergence of a pan-Asian conception of Buddhism, which originally was elaborated in Europe during the second half of the 19th century and rapidly spread uh, to East, uh, led to new modes of Buddhism transfer throughout Asia. In my presentation, I will thus try to trace the spread of the Theravada model uh, on, of Buddhism in China throughout the 20th century, mainly focusing on the origins of the phenomenon in the Republican era, that is uh, the part of the research that I have uh, conducted here in St at Stanford. And uh, uh, this is an, at an attempt to examine how and when this tradition, though initially identified <coughs> with the label of lower vehicle, as you all know, has gained a new status uh, in the eyes of modern Chinese Buddhists. 
uh, in so doing, I will also probe into forms of hybridation. And I, I use the term hybridity, the concept uh, I, I, of hybridity here, um, in order to describe transculturalism in religious transmission. I think that this is, a, uh, I've been working on this concept with uh, Carmen Meinert and Fabienne Jagou. We have uh, an ongoing uh, project on this. And we believe that this concept, uh, the concept of hybridity, uh, better describes uh, the variety of phenomena resulting from mutual uh, uh, cultural exchanges between different traditions, uh, better than <coughs> other uh, concepts describing processes of cultural transmission, such as syncretism, uh, melange, and so on. Just wanted to mention that this is the theoretical background in this. So, more precisely, uh, my presentation will be articulated in five parts. Uh, these are the five main topics I'm, I'm working on, uh, but I will skip some parts of this, of course, due to uh, time constraints. Um, yeah, let me begin with the first part, uh, which is uh, a ter terminology clarification, why and which Theravada? Why am I speaking about a Theravada model and what do I mean uh, while uh, talking about this, uh, this kind of Buddhism? So, uh, very briefly, I, uh, some background. Uh, as you probably all know, the notion of Theravada Buddhism as a category for a unified uh, religious system was developed in modern times. And according to some re recent scholarship, there is no evidence of its use in these terms, so as a, uh, as a label of, of, uh, of a tradition of and uh, of, of a particular religion. Um, in uh, pre-modern Asian sources. Prior to this, uh, um, if taken in a denominational sense, the Pali term Theravada, uh, corresponding to the Sanskrit uh, Stavira Nikaya and the Chinese, Chinese, which is important for us here, Shan Pu, typically referred to one of the two Nikayas believed to have stemmed out from the Second Buddhist Council and which later divided into other sub-denominations. In recent years, in recent years, uh, scholars have pointed to a shift in the understanding of the very notion of Theravada occurred uh, in modern times, following the developments of Buddhist studies in Europe and in Japan. So in short, we can say that Theravada came to identify a text-based and pure form of Buddhism which referred to the Pali Canon. During the first part of the 20th century, this term was progressively chosen by the <coughs> same Buddhists uh, of, the, of the South and Southeast Asian countries uh, of Sri Lanka, Burma, Thailand, Cambodia and Laos to refer to their own form of Buddhism. This understanding of the Theravada tradition is thus a construction of modernity and it is connected with the development of the idea of an alleged original Buddhism, which, uh, an idea which emerged in Western milieus as well as the Pan-Asian idea, um, the last half of the 19th century. The original Buddhism was identified by a certain Orientalism with the Pali Buddhism of South and Southeast Asia, which was, uh, that is with uh, <coughs> what came to be known as Southern Buddhism, and this is true, for instance, for the words uh, Parliament of Religions in Chicago in 1893, and then later, as we we've seen, as Theravada Buddhism. Okay, so now let us move uh, east to China. So Chinese Buddhists uh, were also exposed uh, to these new perspectives uh, and some espoused uh, the idea whereby Pali Buddhism reflected more than any other Buddhist form the original teachings of the Buddha. It should be noticed, uh, however, that the majority of Chinese sources of the first half of the 20th century that they could consult to refer to the forms of Buddhism of South and Southeast Asian countries by the standard Chinese notion of Hinayana, by naming them after the country of origin, and uh, by the new notions of Southern Buddhism and Pali Buddhism, the, the latter uh, to revealing the impact of a modern interpretation of the religion. <coughs> 
This notwithstanding, I argue that the references to Thousand or Pali Buddhism in the Republican Buddhist writings in China do refer to the very notion of Theravada as a unified religious system, which was chosen as a marker of identity by many Southern Buddhists do, during the same decades. So the um, use of Shan Tsuo Pu or Shan, or Shan Tsuo uh, for Jiao, Theravada, which uh, began to be translated as Theravada Buddhism, um, only appeared later in China, as it was the case for Jaffa, Japan. The first occurrences of Shan Tsuo Pu in meant as a translation for Theravada, were introduced by the monks who had traveled to South and Southeast Asia and were thus acquainted with the local modern use of the term. An, ex an example is Fa Fang, uh, a close disciple of Tai Xu, uh, who had traveled to India and Sri Lanka in the 1940s. He later opened uh, the Pali Studies Institute in Xi'an. And uh, let me just make a brief di digression here because I want to introduce to you one of the main, uh, to uh, main uh, characters in our story. Fa Fang, um, late, uh, uh, Fa Fang, a disciple of Tai Xu, as I told you, um, mastered English, Sanskrit, and Pali. And in 1950, he was appointed uh, professor of uh, Mahayana Buddhism uh, at uh, Colombo University. City. Unfortunately, he died uh, the, the, in 1951, uh, still very young. And uh, these images that I am showing to you are taken from, uh, from some material I found here at Stanford. Um, and it's, uh, in particular, it's his memorial book, uh, where you can see his uh, funerals. Uh, and uh, this was for you, Mi Michaela, the elegy with music there. Okay, <laughs> that, <laughs> that was really for you. <laughs> and then uh, he, he, during his, uh, his travels uh, uh, abroad, uh, like this one and this one, so it's full of uh, uh, different. Uh, uh, so just to give you an idea of what was really going on. So going on, um, as I told you, during the first half of the 20th century, really not many people used the, the, the word Shan Tzu Pu to refer to Theravada Buddhism. This became more, more uh, common during the Maoist era. Um, for instance, in 1955, on the occasion of the convey of a relic tooth of the Buddha to Burma uh, within uh, what has been called the Tooth Relic uh, Diplomacy, a part of the Dharma Diplomacy. So Lu Cheng wrote an article on the teaching of Southern Theravada Buddhism in which he admitted that Southern Buddhism is rather close to original Buddhism, for instance. Here you can see one image, uh, again from one of these materials we <coughs> found here, uh, uh, of the Buddha Tooth to going to Burma. So, and uh, another example of the use of uh, Nanfang Shan Tzu Pu uh, to refer to Southern Theravada is uh, an article by Ye Jun, another of the main, uh, of the main characters in our story, and we will uh, meet him later. He went to study to, in Sri Lanka in 1946. So, as as seen before, in, in uh, uh, the articles published on the uh, prominent uh, uh, Buddhist journal Sien Tai Fo Shui, the term Shan Tzu Pu is always translated as Theravada uh, in the English indexes, uh, thus showing the acceptance of the term as a category to identify the contemporary forms uh, of Pali Buddhism. In the new era, and particularly since the 1990s, the term uh, has become also in China a shared definition for the majority of South and Southeast Asian Buddhism. So we we'll just skip uh, the part on the um, Bali Buddhism of, the, of uh, Sichuan Banna because I've not been working on that so much yet. But uh, suffice it to know that in modern times also that part of, uh, of uh, that, that form of Buddhism uh, in southeast, uh, um, southwest uh, China has also um, begun to refer to uh, uh, itself uh, uh, in these terms. <coughs> 
which was not true during the first half of the 20th century. So due, due to, um, due to um, time constraints, I will skip most of this second part of my presentation. Um, I just want to, to, say, to give you a few, uh, a few um, ideas about that. So uh, as, a conquest, uh, as, as a consequence of the addition of uh, uh, Buddhism uh, to the world religions, which occurred in the West, as you know, the, Pan the, the idea of Pan-Asian Buddhism emerged and uh, together with that also an idea of an original and pure form of Buddhism which was believed to be a uh, very text uh, based. Pali literature rega was regarded as the most ancient by a certain uh, European um, Orientalism, I would say, or Oriental studies anyway. It was regarded as the most ancient and thus the closest to an original Buddhism. And this original Buddhism uh, came to be identified with the Pali Buddhism of South and Southeast Asia, the one that was later labeled uh, as Theravada. And uh, one champion uh, of these ideas was Anagarika Dharmapala, who is also responsible for, for having brought these ideas to, to China. He met, for instance, with, with Yang Wenhui, one of the main, uh, one of the two persons that uh, Holmes Welch called the fathers of the reforms and of modern Chinese Buddhism. They met together and Yang Wenhui convinced himself of the importance of uh, Anagarika Dharma Palace uh, projects. And then came Tai Xu. Tai Xu, about Tai Xu, I wanted to tell you something more because he is particularly important in regards to my topic today. Tai Xu also subscribed to these new ecumenical ideas. In 1935, he met uh, the prominent Sinhalese monk Narada, who was himself a key figure in the new trends and went to China to teach Pali language. Uh, it was during uh, the encounters with Narada that Tai Xu conceived the plan to train Chinese monks in Southeast Asian Buddhist communities. S significantly, uh, the Chinese monks uh, belonging to the two programs organized uh, by Tai Xu in order to study in Sri Lanka in 1936 and 1946 uh, were explicitly tasked with retrieving pure original Buddhism and returning uh, as modern monks. So Tai Xu not only embraced these ideas but he also uh, planned to send, uh, to send monks to these countries and particularly to Sri Lanka in order to, be tra uh, to train them as model monks uh, as far as uh, practices are concerned. And these monks uh, all reordained in the Theravada tradition. Um, by the way, these, uh, these study abroad programs have been recently studied by uh, Justin Ritzinger. So, I have come now to speak about the three main uh, parts of my, of my presentation, but uh, what has preceded was necessary in order to, for you to understand better what was going on. Let us now begin with the Theravada model, Agamas and Pali studies. So, um, Buddhist studies carried out in, West and in the West and in Japan. The, the role of Japan is very important in all this history. I, I haven't mentioned it because I skipped that part. I, I, I didn't mention that part, but uh, Japanese scholarship was as important as Western scholar, scholarship in this regard. Anyway, these Buddhist studies um, tended to locate bu pure Buddhism in canonical texts. And this stimulated the in China, a re-evaluation of the Agamas, uh, the trans translations of the so-called Hinayana literature preserved in the, in the Chinese Buddhist canon. Uh, this, uh, the the re-emergence um, uh, of the Agama studies uh, during the Republican China has been, uh, is being actually uh, studied uh, in this uh, uh, very uh, moment by um, uh, Stefania Travagnin and Venerable uh, Analayo. So, Agamas uh, had previously been conceived as lesser or preparatory teachings and had been placed in the, at the very bottom of every classification of the teachings. Uh, 
in an attempt to safeguard the superiority of the Mahayana, but at the same time to accept this modern perspective, Agamas began to be considered by some Chinese um, modern Buddhists, both, and I hear, oh, I don't have the quotation, I'm sorry, that's okay. I quote Fa Fang, the core of original Buddhism and the foundation of the greater as well as the lesser vehicle. So, the previously deemed lesser vehicle and its literature began thus to be regarded as equal to early Indian Buddhism. But as seen, uh, China was in parallel also reached by the notion that original Buddhism had survived in the Theravada tradition and that uh, a pure original text-based form of Buddhism had survived in Sri Lanka and South Asia, Southeast Asia. In this perspective, Agamas began to be equated to the Nikayas, uh, their corresponding scriptures in the Pali Canon. This led to first attempts uh, to develop Pali studies in, newly, in the newly conceived monastic education curricula. For instance, Narada, the one we've, we met him um, uh, meeting, um, we've seen him already meeting uh, Tai Xu uh, a while ago. Narada was, uh, um, was uh, uh, invited to China and he taught Pali at the Pure Karma Society in 1935 and uh, a Pali Study Institute was also established in Xi'an in 1945, even if it only operated for a short time. In these decades, uh, the first translations of Pali literature were also produced. Some texts were translated from the English versions. I'm not going into the details, but you can see the, the, the titles there and other Pali texts were translated from the Japanese. English and Japanese make sense if you consider the, the role of the scholarship of both uh, countries uh, in the development of these ideas. And here you can see a list of uh, works um, translated from the Japanese into Chinese in, in the 40s. Uh, but we also see some of the first translations uh, uh, of Pali literature, literature from Pali into, into Chinese. Um, this, it's, a, uh, it's only a few but significant translations and they were produced by the two of the exchange monks uh, who had studied Pali abro abroad. The already mentioned Fa Fang, who died, as we've seen, in, Sh in Sri Lanka in 1951, and Ye Jun. Ye Jun, uh, Ye Jun is the lay name uh, of, uh, of this monk. We will see something, say something more about him later. Ye Jun uh, translated the Visuddhimagga, his most influential work centered on meditation, which we will see uh, in a few uh, minutes. And, but he also translated uh, uh, the Abhidhammata Sangaha and the Dhammapada. Um, the Dhammapada is a collection of phrases uh, attributed uh, to the Buddha and among the most widely re read scriptures in, in the Southern Buddhist traditions. So the, this text, the Dhammapada, uh, provides us with an interesting example of the circumstances in which these translations were produced, as well as of their possible significance in the broader context of, the modern, of modern Chinese Buddhism. So, we have a postscript and a preface. In the, the postscript is penned by the same Ye Jun. It was written in 1953 in Sri Lanka when he, when he was still a monk. And uh, uh, in this postscript, Ye Jun tells us about the difficulties uh, he encountered during the first years uh, in, in South Asia. Uh, when he had to work as a teacher of Chinese uh, to, for, uh, uh, for, the, for the sons of the Hua Chao, of the um, um, Chinese people, uh, overseas Chinese people, uh, in order to gain uh, enough money to be able to study English and Pali. He writes uh, about the stability brought to, uh, to him by the arrival of, uh, of uh, Fa Fang 
and uh, uh, of the despair for the latter's early death in 1951. That very year, 1951, Ye Jun decided to complete Fa Fang's translation of the Dhammapada uh, with the help of two local panditas. So, the preface of this work, on the other hand, is written by a prominent Chinese master of, uh, this, of, the, of the old 20th century Chinese Buddhism, uh, that is uh, Venerable In Shun. In Shun, in 1952, he was already in Hong Kong, he would then move to Taiwan, he left China. And uh, in his preface, uh, he completes uh, the picture. In addition to giving credits uh, to Ye Jun for his translation, um, In Shun provides the readers with a his an history of the Chinese translations of the text. Uh, the Chinese canon has, in fact, four versions of the Dhammapada, none of them complete. Uh, one is a commentarial work, I'm not going into details. But he goes into details and he compares parts of the Chinese version with the new translation by Ye Jun, pointing to all the similarities. He concludes, I quote, that Reading the new translation of the Dhammapada makes uh, me, in Shun, equally appreciate all the Buddhist lineages and all the sacred scriptures. The canon of the three forms of Buddhism in the world, though such, through such exchanges, cannot but gain in accuracy, richness and brightness. So, in other words, what does in Shun tell us here? It tells us that these uh, translations from the Pali uh, were to be conceived uh, within the general idea of a pan-Asian Buddhism rather than as examples of the uniqueness of the Theravada tradition. And this is important and we will find this again, uh, this very same idea, we will find it again for Vinaya and for meditation. It is important also to point out that during the Republic, uh, the Chinese canonical versions of the Dhammapada began to be studied by Chinese Buddhists, while we have uh, no evidence of the impact of Ye Jun's translation. Chinese Buddhists were going back, they were looking for early forms of Buddhism within their own uh, Chinese uh, translations, regardless of the Pali, trans of the Pali canon. So, I believe uh, that uh, the scale of the translations of Pali canonical texts uh, should not be overestimated. The presence of the Agamas in the Chinese canon, the fact that parts of the Pali canon overlap with the Chinese one, as well as the, the, as the lack of qualified translat translators may be mentioned as reasons why translations of Pali scriptures were only carried out on a small scale, particularly if compared to the uh, huge scale of the translations of Tibetan scriptures during the same decades. Theravada was still there, it was the model, but, they, but if texts were already available in Chinese, there was no real need to uh, translate them again. So, Pali, uh, sorry. Okay. Pali studies uh, developed and flourished in China in more recent times, carried on in contemporary monastic academies. Uh, and by monks and nuns who chose uh, to spend semesters or years in Theravada monastic environments. As soon as he became president of the Buddhist Association of China, Zhao Puchu, who had been the secretary of the lay organization that had hosted Narada in the 1940s, um, immediately resumed the study abroad programs and nowadays these uh, programs have assumed a far larger scale than it had, had ever had in, uh, during the Republic. But it's uh, important to know that the roots of the, of the old phenomenon is in the Republican era. So, let us now move to uh, the, uh, the um, Theravada model and Indic Vinaya practices. I have to tell you that this is uh, a research I have conducted uh, earlier um, and uh, I have already published and I am 
and one of my articles is forthcoming uh, uh, studies on this uh, on this uh, um, very um, topic. So I will uh, probably just give you some uh, information about that and then move to the meditation part, which is the, the newest part of the research that I have been doing here in, in Stanford together with the, uh, with the translation of the Pali uh, texts. But something has to be said about Vinaya because it is one of the most important uh, aspects of the whole phenomenon. So. Uh, as for monastic discipline, during the first decade of the 20th century, many Chinese Buddhists um, embraced the idea that the original Indian Vinaya was best preserved by Southeast Asian monasticism. Um, in particular, as already um, uh, happened, uh, at, as it had already happened in Japan, in the 1930s, the Sinhalese monastic community began to be understood to embody the e ideal image of the original Buddhist Sangha, also in China, as shown, for instance, by the announcement of the first group of monks going to study uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, published in February 1936 uh, in the Buddhist journal Hai Chao Yin, which depicted the island as a place where the monks still followed uh, the Vinaya as they did 2,000 years ago. You can see that the, the, the very idea that we've seen before is uh, here uh, clearly stated. Okay. So, Despite, it has to be clear that, clear that despite referring to Theravada model, existing Chinese translations of the Vinaya were employed, so the Pali Vinaya was not consulted at all, neither adapted. This was probably a question of legitimacy of the ordination lineage. The adoption of a different Vinaya would have under, undermined the validity of the Chinese monastic institution as a, as a as a whole. Nevertheless, the consequences of the spread of the Theravada model in Vinaya matters were far-reaching from the very beginning and eventually led to significant reshaping of Vinaya practices in China. As I have shown, uh, shown uh, in, uh, in one of my recent studies, during the Republican era, rights that had long been disregarded and disciplinary rules that had been forgotten were rediscovered and implemented in certain key monasteries. Great emphasis was placed uh, on the core rituals prescribed in the Vinaya texts, specifically the bi-monthly recitation of the Pratimoksha, the summer retreat, and its closing cer ceremony. These ritual uh, pr procedures had gradually faded away uh, after the Tang Sun era. They were tentatively revived between the end of the Ming and the beginning of the Qing. There is evidence of that they were carried out in some places afterward, but they were never again a widespread practice in later times. As a result, they were generally ignored in modern China, while they were believed to be co commonly observed by the monastics uh, in Southeast Asia. So in the trend toward recovering an original form of Buddhism, they began to be reintroduced in the Chinese monastic environment and are nowadays practiced in a growing number of exemplary monasteries, even if um, the forms that, that, that they have taken on are kind of hybrid forms. So, and I'm just going on, so hybrid forms uh, as far as summer, summer retreat is concerned, for instance. Uh, summer retreats were re-implemented, but it often implied that monastics left their own mon monasteries in order to study uh, elsewhere, which is not uh, allowed in the Theravada countries, but rarely, but significantly, um, it, it uh, began to be seen as a period of immobilization, as in the Theravada tradition, just to give you an idea. So, as for ordination procedures, uh, this is a more interesting topic probably. So, the new ideas about a pure and original Buddhist practices uh, um, in, in the Theravada tradition resulted also in the already mentioned phenomenon of Chinese monks going to Southeast Asia in order to be reordained. 
a choice that shows their conviction that the Theravada ordination criteria were the only orthodox ones. And I should add here that um, even uh, a, a Vinaya master uh, such as Hong Yi, the most important Vinaya master of the 20th century China, um, believed that uh, lineages, Chinese ordination lineages, were not valid anymore. So that was a very widespread idea. On the other hand, as we have seen, um, Fa Fang and all the exchange monks who went to Sri Lanka had to be reordained and to take Pali names. As for China, uh, some masters uh, introduced uh, in their monastic communities different ordination criteria inspired by the model of Southern Buddhism, uh, as was the case of the Zhou, who uh, tried to adopt uh, um, um, the, the idea of bestowing novice ordination at, at the time on to of tonsure. Um, Similarly, it was in these years that uh, a few monastics uh, also began to discuss the restoration of nuns' ordination according to dual ordination system, uh, that is, procedures that were first brought to China from Sri Lanka during the 5th century, but were later mostly disregarded in China. These procedures were re-established in the early 1980s, significantly on the request of Sinhalese Buddhists, and they have become the only possible procedures for nuns' uh, ordination in, May in mainland China since the year 2000. Of course, Chinese monks do, to be fully ordained, also receive the bodhisattva, bodhisattva precepts. So these forms of ordination, both the one of Thejo and this dual ordination, are thus, are thus again to be considered hu hybrid forms between Theravada model and the Chinese Mahayana Vinaya tradition. So, okay. So, uh, finally, among the forgotten rules, Vinaya rules, particular emphasis was placed on the prohibition to eat afternoon, which was believed to be followed by monks in places such as Burma, Sri Lanka and Thailand, and which was not commonly observed in East Asia. During the Republic, this practice became a symbol of disciplinary strictness, and it is still so in nowadays China and in Taiwan. As for the rule of begging or arms taking, it was very exceptional in China and only existed in some strict monasteries and as under particular um, ritual circumstances. During the Republic, this rule was introduced in a few monasteries and it is nowadays practiced during formal events such as the end of, of the ordinations or other big, big celebrations, evidence of the fact that Vinaya regulations may also be resurrected in mere ritualized forms. Nowadays, the Theravada model of begging for a living is followed by some monastics in Taiwan and who, whoever has been in Taipei has clearly noticed that these monastics in, in, in Taipei streets that begging with their big bowl. Um, but it is uncommon in the People's Republic of China, also among the Theravada monks, due to governmental regulations. Anyhow, it should be noticed that, that also in these two cases, uh, both the uh, ritualized form of begging and the form of begging in, in Taiwan, uh, the practice has to be regarded as hybrid, given that money is usually accepted instead of food, which is clearly not uh, possible in a Theravada tradition. And then rules uh, for closing. Uh, also rules of closing were discussed during the first half of the 20th century, resulting in some monks adopting Theravada robes, which are still realized according to Vinaya prescriptions, or saffron robes meant to mirror Theravada robes color. Even, in modern, even if modern robes were eventually to be adopted, it is still not uncommon in nowadays China to uh, encounter Chinese monks dressed in hybrid mon monastic robes like the one of Jidu in this, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, picture. 
um, so robes in Chinese style, but in saffron color, which uh, is still meant to recall Theravada robes. So finally, let us see, say something about uh, the Theravada model and Buddhist meditation. So in the last few decades, uh, a true fever Sorry, okay. A true fever for Theravada meditation practices has arisen in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, and more recently in mainland China, allowing Deng Weiren to speak about, I quote, a Theravada fundamentalist movement which aims to purge all Mahayana elements from its practice. So, in reality, uh, the phenomenon, uh, which has been studied in deep uh, by Liu Yash in her PhD, uh, in to, um, finished in 2017, so this phenomenon has taken different forms, many of which are attempting to compromise with Chinese Buddhism rather than opposing it. Not only have Theravada meditation communities headed by Southeast Asian masters been founded, uh, including a few monasteries, uh, but, uh, and per but par particularly a large and growing number of lay uh, non-denominational meditation centers. But on the other hand, also Theravada meditation is also being practiced regularly in, ma in many Chinese Buddhist monasteries, uh, thus favoring forms of hybridity. Uh, I'm speaking about uh, um, retreats where Chan meditation is practiced together with Theravada or, uh, or uh, monasteries with, where, um, where Vipassana meditation is practiced together with Lamrim, Tibetan Lamrim teachings and so on. So very hybrid forms of meditation. So even if it is fair, fair to argue that only in contemporary times forms of Theravada meditation tangibly found their way into Chinese Buddhism, I argue that also in this case the relationship with the Republican uh, era should not be underestimated. As we have seen, a rediscovery of the literature preserved in the Hinayana section of the Chinese Buddhist canon occurred during the Republican era. Many of these texts concerned meditation techniques. Within the general trend to a re-evaluation of the original teachings of the Buddha, some of these forms of meditation were rediscovered in the Chinese canon and at the same time they were related to those practiced by the Theravada Buddhists. Again, as we've seen before, Theravada model was there as a model, but the texts used were, in, in the majority of the cases, there are a few exceptions and we will see them, they were those that were already available in Chinese. So early meditative, te uh, meditative techniques, uh, which had not been used for centuries in China, began thus to be put into practice by mainstream uh, Chinese Buddhists. Uh, as in the case of um, Miao Jing, a uh, case that has been pointed to, uh, me, uh, to, to me by um, Raoul Birnbaum. Uh, Miao Jing was a master in the Tiantai tradition, which is important and we will see later why. And he used to employ early techniques with his disciples with the idea that they were more effective than Chan meditation. So he had a, a stand against the Chan meditation. Another um, notable example, a notable example as a matter of fact, because also, uh, also Miao Jin was part of this trend, a notable example is provided by the four bases or four foundations of mindfulness, of the four sites uh, of, for recollection, so four forms of contemplation to be practiced as a series or independently, and ha which ha have already been um, uh, met by us uh, during uh, Michael Radich's uh, talks uh, last uh, a week ago. So these uh, four uh, bases, they were explained 
not only in Hinayana uh, scriptures, also in, in some of the, uh, of the uh, Chinese scriptures uh, of early practices translated into Chinese, but they, all, they uh, also were described in many Mahayana texts, including the Yogacarabhumi Shastra. And the Yogacarabhumi was it, in itself being rediscovered in modern China, as was the Yogacara as a whole, which was evaluated as a form of origin original Mahayana school. This is a different uh, uh, topic, of course, but everything is connected. Um, the four, uh, the four, uh, the Senyan Chu, the four bases of mindfulness, were also um, uh, described by prominent Pre Chan and uh, Pre Chan masters, and within the Tiantai tradition, in particular, important in this regard is Jay's exposition of the perfection of Diana. And Jay's exposition on, on the perfection of Diana was uh, one of the most studied. Uh, uh, scripture in order to re-establish uh, and revive uh, these particular forms uh, of meditation. So a considerable interest in these practices can be inferred from a number of articles published in Buddhist periodicals of the time. Uh, both uh, reprints of canonical uh, or historical texts on the Senyan Chu and new explanations and commentaries. The four bases of mindfulness uh, still form a fundamental practice of some of the Theravada meditation traditions which are presently sp uh, spreading in China. During the Republic, particular attention was given to the meditations on impurity, implying the visualization of one's own body transforming into a corpse and a skeleton, which has also been uh, introduced, uh, since it's one of the four, uh, by Michael Radich, Radich last week. For example, Tiantai master Xian Min wrote an article supporting this practice as a way to counter desire and describing it as a fundamental practice co common both to Hinayana and Mahayana. I use Hinayana because he uses Xiaosheng. Um, significantly, the practice was also taught by the renowned Yogacara scholar, uh, scholar Zhou Shujia. Um, however, the meditation on, on uh, filthiness was also revi revived outside Tiantai or, or Yogacara cycles. For instance, uh, Tan Xuan, who had studied esoteric Buddhism in Japan, wrote a long article on this practice, tracing its occurrences throughout the old Buddhist canon. Uh, and also Tantric master and Vinaya master Nanghai integrated in it in his handbook book uh, for basic meditation practices, which is still in use nowadays, uh, where we find a meditation on death and nine forms of the meditation on impurity, all inspired by Chinese canonical texts, and particularly in, this, in the last case by the um, Yogacarabhumi Shastra. So from the above, we can infer that although Theravada meditation was generally perceived uh, as the living tradition which was closer to these uh, original forms of Buddhist meditation, no need was felt to introduce anew the early Buddhist meditation techniques as long as they were already included in the Chinese canon, just as in the case we have seen for the Vinaya. A prominent exception which I want to make is uh, provided by a still young uh, Tang Yongtong, who in an article dated 1927 translated the Southern Anapanasati Sutta, a fundamental text in Theravada Buddhism centered on the practice of mindfulness of breathing. Tang related the text to the extant Chinese translation attributed to An Shikao and to other similar material in the Chinese canon, emphasizing both the correspondences between the two Buddhist canons and the importance of, uh, uh, of being able to access a more complete text translated from the Pali version. 
Not sur surpri sur sur surprisingly, however, in the same years, the Tianjin Lay Buddhist Association published the prefaces of the Chinese version of the, of the text, testifying to an interest not so much in the Theravada text as in the, the Buddhist practice itself, regardless of the tradition involved. So, a very different case is provided by the translation of the Vizuddhi Magga, uh, a systematic condensation of Buddhist doctrine and meditation techniques in the Theravada tradition authored by the 5th century Indian commentator Buddha Gosha and which had never reached China before. This translation from the Pali was by far the most influential of all translations from the Pali language originated during the Republican era. I would uh, uh, quote it uh, with the, uh, Lamri, the Putitao Thirty, the Lamrim Chemmo uh, trans, uh, of Tsongkhapa, translated by Fatsun. These two texts are still practiced not only in Theravada or Tibetan uh, environments, uh, respectively, but also by Chinese Buddhist monks uh, in uh, mainstream Chinese monasteries. So the text. The text uh, was uh, uh, realized in the 1950s by Ye Jun, when uh, he was still uh, is, he was still a, a monk um, by the name Liao Zan, or his Pali name was Damakiti. He had, um, Liao, uh, Ye Jun had joined Taishu's study abroad programs to Sri Lanka in 1946. The text was adopted in the curricula of studies of the First Buddhist Academy of China as early as 1961. It was finally published in 1981 and it became one of the most well-known texts in the Theravada tradition in China. So, in 1981, Ye Jun also published uh, in the uh, Buddhist Association of China's journal Fain a description of the meditative techniques of the Theravada tradition, in which he gave basic but detailed instructions of the preliminary practices, the correct pra uh, posture to be, to, to be adopted, the breathing, breathing exercises, mindfulness of breathing, and so on. And in the same text, he then uh, um, summarizes the 40 meditation subjects explained in the Visuddhi Magga. This text is still um, available in many websites, both belonging to Chinese Theravada and to mainstream Chinese Buddhists. So, as uh, anticipated, the spread, and I'm nearly now approaching my final remarks, but I just wanted to say that the spread of Theravada meditation techniques um, has assumed a new scale and speed since the new era. The, here you can see the main, uh, main uh, meditation practice is Vipassana and the main uh, meditation and, and the main tradition are listed in this slide. Mm -hmm. Really not going into details, it's uh, not uh, the topic I am working on today with you, but uh, um, I, I want to to point out that uh, they, this uh, Vipassana meditation and the other forms of uh, Theravada meditation that are currently mm, taught by uh, uh, masters coming from uh, Southeast Asia uh, are still perceived as early Buddhist practices and they are put into connection with the, with the practices, early Buddhist practices that are available in, Ch in the Chinese Buddhist canon. And also in this case, we have forms of hybridity. So before going to my final remarks, I just wanted you to see these pictures of one of the case studies I've, I'm working on. I'm, as I told you, I'm working on this uh, phenomenon throughout the 20th century. And as far as the, 20th, uh, the, the second half of the century and contemporary times are concerned, I've been working, for instance, of this, uh, on this Mahasati meditation. Mahasati is a form of dynamic vipassana. Mahasati Meditation Center uh, located in one nunnery in Sichuan, the Shi uh, where, where Vipassana uh, meditation is practiced, uh, is pra practiced uh, in uh, a Chinese Buddhist context and within other Chinese Buddhist practices. Okay, so my final remarks. I'm sorry, I'm a little late. Is it okay? Okay.
So the spread of uh, uh, the Theravada model in modern China is a multifaceted phenomenon that has become increasingly visible in the last three decades. And this is true also from a mere iconographic and architectural perspective, considering that South and Southeast Asian statues and images are increasingly displayed in Chinese monasteries and that buildings in a Southern Buddhist style, like the one you can see here, it's from Utai Shan, um, are uh, being built inside Chinese monastic compounds. However, this paper has shown that a transfer of Theravada teachings and practices had already begun during the Republican era, and that this early trend had an impact on the developments of Chinese Buddhism throughout the 20th century. We have seen uh, how it became a common notion to consider the so-called Hinayana equal to original Buddhism and how this resulted not only in a re-evaluation of the early labeled uh, lesser teachings and, and texts, but also in a new appreciation, appreciation of Pali Buddhism. This stimulated exchange projects um, mutual visits and uh, uh, also early developments of Pali studies. Um, also the very idea that original Vinaya is preserved in the Theravada countries has come down to contemporary Chinese Buddhism where Theravada monastics are still considered exemplary in this regard and hybrid Vinaya practices have also evolved where compliance with an ideal model goes hand in hand with accommodations to local needs and circumstances. As for meditation, during the Republican uh, era, early cultivation techniques uh, were rediscovered in the canonical scriptures, tested and uh, appreciated uh, by Chinese Buddhists. Uh, practices such as fasting and breathing techniques, uh, death meditation or, uh, the, for uh, the Sen Yan Chu were believed to be equal with the equivalent Theravada meditation techniques and uh, they are still practiced in contemporary times together with, mo uh, with modern forms of Vipassana. So what does all this tell us about modern Chinese Buddhism? First of all, the increase, in uh, the increase in prestige of the Theravada tradition uh, in contemporary China has to be, uh, to be uh, mentioned. Uh, we could easily argue that uh, as a consequence of the Orientalist construction of an, or, or, uh, of an original Buddhism and of its identification with the Southern Buddhism, uh, Inayana is no more unanimously looked down upon in China, even if many Buddhists continue to have an ambivalent attitude in this regard. But there is more than this. The re-evaluation of the lesser or southern traditions was a result of the acceptance in China of the idea of Buddhism as a pan-Asian religion, which created the space both for the reintegration of early scriptures and practices into mainstream Chinese Buddhism and for the development of new forms of Buddhism, provided they were perceived as legitimate pa parts of the Buddhist tradition. The two different situations involving Theravada Buddhism that can be observed in contemporary China are part and parcel of this modern conception of the religion. On the one hand, we are witnessing a first development of Theravada communities independent from Chinese Buddhism, but still perceived as part of the same Buddhist family. On the other hand, as it, ha it has also um, happened with the spread of Tibetan Buddhism, hybrid practices are developing within Chinese Buddhist cycles in an ecumenical pan-Asian perspective for the sake and in the name of the allness of Buddhism. Thank you. I Thank you, and sorry, I really no took problem. a little longer. We have some time for questions. Students first, right? Oh, students <laughs> first, because it's lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs>
Mm. This last picture, I, I decided to use it for um, just to, 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 for my greetings. Uh, in order to show uh, another aspect of the phenomenon, which is the spread of Chinese Buddhism in Theravada uh, counties here, it's Bangkok, uh, and uh, the presence of a Chinese Buddhism uh, uh, sign is very evident, uh, I think, there. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the uh, translation styles they use when translating from Pali sources? Like, do they use like modern, like Mandarin, or uh, do they try the to Translation imitate? styles, yes. oh sorry, didn't. Ah, okay, you have both actually. Um, there are, um, you have both, and I, I kind of suspect, but I haven't seen uh, so well through that yet, but I kind of suspect it also goes uh, together with the, uh, with the um, knowledge and with the educational level of the monk. For instance, Ye Jun translates in Baihua, while other translations are in, uh, are, uh, and particularly those from the Japanese, are in Wen Yong Wen. So. What was this your question? Yes. Okay. So you have both. I see. Yeah. Yes. Um. Yes. Interesting. For your talk, I was wondering if you could tell us why there is this need to go back to Theravada and to the original forms of Buddhism, because it was very interesting. I was thinking when Buddhism arrived in China, they had to look back at India for authenticity, legitimacy, but then Buddhism came to be a Chinese religion and now they are looking at Sri Lanka and they are going back to the origins. So do you have an idea why? Yes, yeah, that's uh, exactly, it's all the part that I have not, <laughs> I have, I, I didn't focus on today. Um, yes, um, just in short, how can I explain this? Um, in it's uh, um, on the wake of, the, of this uh, um, integration of Buddhism uh, as w um, in, uh, in the list of the world religions, um, the, um, the idea of Pan-Asian Buddhism emerged. And this idea uh, make, made all the different forms of Buddhism, um, made it possible that all the different forms of Buddhism in Asia began to perceive themselves, each other, as part of the same uh, big fami family. Family, uh, despite all the differences that, that were there, and uh, and so what happens is that uh, pilgrimages uh, were uh, began again. So Chinese uh, Buddhists, for instance, but it's not only them. I'm, I'm focusing on China, but they began to go. Uh, Japanese Buddhists did this earlier, as um, as Jaffe has been. Uh, uh, studying. Um, so uh, Chinese Buddhists would go to India uh, for pilgrimage, so India became again the center, it was perceived again as the center of the tradition, and it was rediscovered. Anagarika, Anagarika Dharmapala, for instance, uh, had um, a, a very uh, articulated project, and he discussed it with Yang Wenhui, so not only with him, with all the Buddhists uh, in the world, but in our case, uh, it's interesting to see that he discussed this with Yang Wenhui, and uh, his project was to spread Buddhism, to reunite Night Buddhist, but also to resurrect Buddhism and uh, revive Buddhism in, in India. So the idea was recreated that India was the center of the tradition. And, uh, and it's amazing because um, before the, uh, Anagarika Dharmapala's uh, visit to, to Shanghai at the end of the 19th century, um, in the 90s, 1890s, um, Practically, probably no uh, contacts had existed anymore for nearly a, a, a millennium between Sri Lankan Buddhists and and uh, Chinese Buddhists, and then it, it began it began again. So that that's uh, did I answer? Yes, yes, okay. thank you. Well, just just to add to that and to clarify, uh, Anagarika Dhammapala was a student of Olcott. Right. And so you, you mentioned a couple of times uh, that there's also influence from European and Japanese mm -hmm. uh, elite circles. And, and it seems that there's this shift from an internal tradition, uh, you know, like Simone said, like once you get to this kind of high point in, in indigenous Chinese Buddhism that, that persists for millennia. But then when you start to have the forces of Japan and Europe coming in, and, 
into the 20th century or the middle of the 20th century. Uh, then you start to have a feedback loop that is developed with these academic uh, Westerners and, and Japanese who are studying Buddhism telling Asian Buddhists what Buddhism is, and then that gets picked up locally. Uh, do you see that in the materials that you work with, for instance, with Fa Hong? Is, uh, is he ever talking about Max Muller or? No, Fafang doesn't, but uh, Yang Wenhui does, for instance. So, uh, no, but the, the, the impact of, uh, of uh, uh, this, uh, of both actually uh, perspectives is very evident. In the case of, of uh, the revival of the Yogacara, for instance, you see more the impact of the Japanese. Uh, Yogacara was perceived as original Mahayana. So, and you can see that. And uh, let me see. Uh, I'm trying to. No, they don't really mention um, this kind of scholarship. But for instance, uh, and I wanted to mention one particular um, one particular text. If I found it here, which was translated. Okay, should be here. Uh, so. Um, no, I don't find it. It's not that important. But uh, um, in the, I, I, I did not focus so much uh, uh, on the on the development of the idea of uh, uh, original Buddhism. This uh, the the idea of, of original Buddhism developed. Uh, it was only in a few um, in on in some uh, uh, circles it was perceived as equal to Theravada Buddhism. In other circles, have, we have seen with Lu Chan, for instance, but Yun Shun also has much to, to say about that. Uh, they they admit that Theravada Buddhism is closer, probably, uh, but uh, it's not the same as uh, the original Buddhism. And uh, in the case of Yun Shun, it goes further. He said they all say that original Buddhism is is, uh, is equal with Theravada Buddhism. This is not true. The original Buddhism is represented by the Agamas, which were written much, much earlier than the Pali Canon. So we have it. We don't need them. So there was much more going on than I have explained today. Just uh, okay. So and you can see uh, in in the in in this kind of uh, of. Um, Controver controversies and in this kind of, of talks going on, you can see the impact of one or the other uh, scol uh, trad scholarly traditions and, uh, and so on. So uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, sure. yeah? OK. Yes, and of course, I didn't mention, but uh, Dharma, Dharma, uh, uh, Dharmapala was uh, clearly connected with the Theosophical Society. Okay. Yes? Uh, you mentioned the influence of Japanese scholarship on uh, the Chinese situation. Have, have you done any comparative work on how Japanese Buddhists, not just the scholars who are reading the Western materials, but Japanese Buddhists themselves, how their reaction to that com compared to the Chinese reaction? Similarities, differences? Okay. Um, no, I haven't done uh, any any study myself, but uh, Richard Jaffe is working on this, and we've we've exchanged uh, opinions. Uh, and but he doesn't seem to mention China. No, he was very surprised by what I was doing. So we have been, uh, we we have um, ex uh, exchanged. What happens is just is that the Japanese the Japanese phenomenon just predates by uh, by a few decades uh, the Chinese one. So that's why I always say uh, tend to say that uh, it's the evidence here is that Dharma uh, Dharmapala and so the the Sri Lanka and so the the Mahabodhi Society idea was. Uh, um, predominant in the development of the Chinese uh, of the Chinese uh, phenomenon, but at the same time, considering how important uh, Japanese uh, Buddhism and the Japanese Buddhist scholarship was for Chinese Buddhists at this, in these very years, I kind of think that uh, um, the Japanese the fact that Japanese monks used to go to Sri Lanka in order to be reordained in order to to trace. Uh, uh, original and, uh, and pure Vinaya a uh, few m decades before has to be uh, considered and probably uh, was is part uh, of uh, um, 
it, it probably influenced uh, the Chinese phenomenon as well. So I, I have uh, no evidence of Japanese uh, uh, monks, Buddhists uh, mentioning the Chinese phenomenon, but uh, uh, why should they? After all, they uh, they were there first, and uh, and so there was no influence from China to Japan in this case, uh, for instance. So I would yeah. While the, the, the impact of the Japanese, uh, of the Japanese uh, part, uh, you can see it clearly from uh, the translation uh, uh, of texts uh, from uh, uh, Pali to Japanese and from the Japanese translation in, into Chinese. So here you can see how important Japanese scholarship, uh, denominational and non-denominational Japanese scholarship was for the development also of this part, particular part of the modern Chinese policy. So just one, uh, some question in that. Uh, one of the characteristics uh, that you see in Japan, and it goes actually goes back even earlier in the other period, is a sense of the inauthenticity of Mahayana. Mm -hmm. And the beginning of a critique of Mahayana, this is not, the, uh, is that what picked up in China as strongly as it was among some Japanese? So, um, in other words, systematic studies of why we cannot believe that the Mahayana Sutras were taught by the Buddha, and why some of the doctrines in those sutras are not authentic Buddhism. That type of okay. serious uh, critique of Mahayana Buddhism is not authentic. Okay, the, there was a critique of the Mahayana Buddhism, but uh, the and I'm sure that there were uh, 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 similar studies as well. And I think In Shun uh, mentions them in his own th uh, works, and he himself kind of uh, um, represents this uh, a form of these ideas. But he then um, saves Mahayana. So there was a way to say to to save Mahayana. Um, and the case of Yin Shun, I'm not a, 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 um, an expert of Yin Shun. Yin Shun has been studied uh, uh, by uh, Stefania Travagnina, and I know Yin Shun through her studies. But what Yin Shun uh, did, he saved in a way the Mahayana tradition, Chinese tra tradition, um, recognizing in the Agamas the original um, teachings of the Buddha and the basis also for the Mahayana. So that's what he did. So there was a, a, also there a debate going on, uh, probably uh, mirroring what was going on in Japan also in this case. I don't know much about that and thank you, I, I, I will go into this. What I can tell you that you, we can have a, a, a sense of this, uh, um, of this debate going on if we look at what at the, at the, um, at Inshun's uh, uh, ideas about, uh, about the all, so yes. We have time for one more question. Oh. Sure. Yeah. Can I, if I can follow on from that, um, I believe that a lot of this is also roughly contemporaneous with um, the development of discourses about so the so-called sinification or sinicization of Buddhism, the way that it was transformed to become characteristically Chinese in more scholarly circles. And then there were um, polemics between figures like Rushin and D.T. Suzuki on mm -hmm. aspects of that question. Is there any sign that your figures were aware of that type of problematic? Are they using a discourse about the corruption of true Buddhism by Chinese cultural influence? Or do they see themselves as working to purify Buddhism of that kind of heritage? Yes, many of them did. Miao Jin, for instance, did. Um, but um, and this, um, I've been studying this part uh, particularly for the Vinaya. So uh, the the very idea was uh, to um, many in the majority of the cases the idea was to accommodate uh, the two visions. But in some idea, in some uh, cases you can see the Joe, for instance, um, um, a trend to. Um, to go back to the original Vinaya and get rid of all the um, of, of all the Chinese influences, uh, the influences of the Chinese culture that were so much evident in the Nan Shan Lu tradition, for instance, which was perceived as a Chinese Vinaya. Uh, 
Are and they, are they linking ending. these things specifically to traits that they regard as more generally characteristic of Chinese culture in some way? So are they saying, for example, <coughs> uh, Chinese Buddhists got obsessed with the notion of filial piety mm -hmm. and yes. that led them down the wrong path? Or yes. Chinese yeah. Buddhists were too optimistic about the moral qualities of sentient beings mm -hmm. and they're not sufficiently uh, on their guard against the corruption of our real nature, those kinds of things. Okay. Um, for instance, the, yes, th there were such debates and uh, um, one that I can mention because I've been working on is the one uh, about filial piety. Uh, we, the the um, very uh, the predominance of uh, of a filial pi piety um, content in the Brahma Jala Sutra, uh, so the, the the Bodhisattva precepts of the Brah uh, of the um, Brahmanet Sutra. Uh, um, so the, the Fan Wan Jing is, um, represents, um, was the uh, main text for the, um, for the Bodhisattva precepts and for the Bodhisattva ordination used since uh, um, the early Tan Dynasty down to contemporary times and it's still used for that. But in the, and, and it, as you all know, it's uh, uh, seen as an apocryphal scripture and it, and it really has a lot of, uh, pass, uh, of um, text that reveal a clear Chinese vo world view, the respect of hierarchy, for instance, the, 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 the role of the emperor there, and filial piety. And because of these uh, uh, contents, uh, some masters from the first part of the uh, of the um, of the 20th century, among whom Tai Chi himself preferred and turned to the um, Yoga uh, Charabhumi uh, Bodhisattva precepts uh, because they they were perceived as original Buddhists. So yes, it's only one example to tell you. Yes, of course, the, the, these all were were um, debates going on. Yeah. We have to give up our room and give up our speakers so she can have lunch. Uh, but not before <laughs> thanking her for today's talk. Thank you. Thank you so much.